Good evening. It's uh, five o'clock and we're ready to start. Hopefully everybody's having a great day, staying safe and healthy as it is. Welcome to the first ever BoomerWorks online virtual discovery meeting. We are so happy to have uh, made, uh, that you've made the time to explore self-employment uh, with us this evening. Uh, BoomerWorks is a financially sponsored entity of United Charitables, a registered 501c3 public charity. More on that later. Before we go directly into tonight's presentation, we want to make some introductions and establish some online meeting standards. We realize that many people in this time are pretty familiar with Zoom and online meetings, but there may be a few that this is their first experience and we want to kind of help them along. So uh, let's proceed. Uh, my name is Michael Butera, and I'm one of the facilitators at BoomerWorks. And this evening we have as a co-presenter uh, the founder and actually the inspiration behind BoomerWorks, Cheryl Lazar. Say hello, Cheryl. Hello, everyone. Lovely to be with you. Thanks for, thanks for joining. Uh, if you want more information about us or anybody else in the BoomerWorks family, you can simply go to boomerworks.org and you'll find, uh, you'll find the information there. We have two people helping us this evening, uh, Heidi and Ann. They're going to be checking out your questions and things like that. So uh, you may have some others that you see notes from as we proceed. So enough with the introductions. Uh, let's talk about uh, some standards for this evening's online engagement. First, we ask that everybody stays on mute. You know, the truth of the matter is that uh, there are pets that walk around, kids that come in and out, and radios and other noise, and uh, sometimes people are on two different devices. If that happens uh, to you, we'd ask you that you only be on one advice because all that provides, uh, you know, feedback and uh, lots of noise in the background. So if you would stay on mute, it'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, everything that you see uh, on the screen comes uh, through a taskbar, and it usually appears at the bottom of the screen. Sometimes a little different on uh, other devices, but the basics are all the same. You can usually find in the upper right-hand corner uh, three little dots, and if you click on those dots, uh, you have some video options. Uh, if you press start the video, then everybody on the call will be able to see you uh, and has an opportunity uh, to, uh, for you to see them. Now we're going to record this program. So if you prefer not to be recorded, simply do not check start video. You'll still be on the call, except you won't be seen or heard. After these instructions, uh, We'll let you know when the recording begins, and so you know we're not recording at, at this very moment. As I said, we have two uh, assistants this evening, Ann and Heidi, who will get a better introduction than I just gave them. And rest assured, we're going to try to uh, answer your questions. However, this is a relatively large audience this evening, so we may not be able to get to every question one-on-one. -on -one. We'll kind of aggregate them so that the big picture is there. And at the end of the session, we'll provide you with instructions on how to receive a personal reply to your question and how to obtain a copy of the slides. Now, some more details. As I said, please stay on mute. If necessary, we can unmute you. And it's a little different, as I said, if you're on a smartphone, uh, and some devices uh, as to the instructions, but we think you're smart enough to figure it out. So by running your cursor along the bottom of the screen, you'll find the menu. And in that menu, there's some important items that you need to know about and become familiar with. One of the most important ones is called chat. It usually appears as a little orange button on the bottom and says chat. If you click on chat, you're able to send messages, ask questions, uh, visit individuals online, either 
collectively or individually. And we would really love to get to know you better. So we'd like to try the chat out. If you're comfortable, click on chat and let us know where you're from. If you happen to be on a cell phone or one of those other type of devices, the default is going to be your phone number or a device name. In that case, again, if you're comfortable, what we'd like you to do is just enter your name so that we have an opportunity to know who you are. So as I said, why don't you type away and let's see what happens in the chat. Ah, Silver Springs, Bethesda, those are Maryland places. Uh, see some in Baltimore. Laurel, a lot of Marylanders wow. here. <laughs> a lot of Mar There's some DC folks. Wonderful, wonderful. Catonsville. Here's Arlington, Virginia. Wonderful. I think you've gotten the idea. Okay. Thanks for uh, thanks for trying out the chat and helping us get to know you a little bit better. Uh, so let's try one more chat. This time, uh, find the find the uh, icon again. Uh, for chat. And if you would, let us know what you hope to get out of this evening's session. And that'll help us as we move through the program. So go ahead and type your answer to that question. What is it that you really hope you get out of this evening's session? We'll wait a few minutes to make sure you've had an opportunity to address uh, your question to us. Again, what do you hope to get out of this evening's session? Go ahead and type. And if you could make your response kind of short and brief, that would be fantastic. So we yeah, have room for everyone. <laughs> short, short will help. The short, short is up. good. <laughs> okay, we see some here. How 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 to run my years of experience into a new business? Resources for being self-employed. Ideas on supplementing my income. Ah, hidden job market. There's a good one. Growing uh, my gig efforts, uh, how, to uh, how to successfully uh, su sustain a small business. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, as I said, we have some friends who are going to check these out, and we'll be using them throughout the program this evening. So with all that in mind, I'm about to start the recording. So from this point forward, all the material will be recorded. Again, if you don't wish to be recorded, Simply go to the three dots where it says start video, unclick it, and uh, you will not be recorded. Or your, Any, your face will not be seen more, oh, more your specifically. Face will, yeah, right. More specifically, your face won't be seen. But, uh, but there will be no recording of your activity either. All right. So I need to find record. And there we go. And we're off and running. Okay. So as I said, if you have questions uh, or you want to offer advice, you simply go to the chat box, put it in, and we'll work together to make sure that we get as, as much of that as possible. One other thing about the uh, bar, there's a thing called participant icon. And if you click on the icon, you're going to have an opportunity to see all the participants that are in the talk. And as I said, you can send them individual or collective messages. But remember, that's only if they put their name in. If they came in on a cell phone, they came in on a device that has a default name, we won't know who those people are. Hopefully, you know, you'll be able to change that and we'll be able to help each other out. Last point. Now that we've got over the digital skills, we've got a couple old-fashioned things to mention to you. I know you've heard of these things. They're called pencils, and uh, this one's called a pen. So they're not very digital, as it turns out. But this evening, we're going to be doing some exercises and having a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper or a notebook will be very, very helpful to you as we explore self-employment. So look around wherever you're at, find that pencil or pen. And the back uh, of a napkin, whatever works. <laughs> or the back of a napkin, that worked too. And, and we'll move forward from there. So thanks again for joining us this evening. And uh, we're going to get started by one of the other functions, which is 
a poll. Now, in just a few moments, this poll will appear in a more detailed fashion on your screen. And we're interested in why you're considering self-employment. We've come up with six basic ideas about why that might be of interest to you. Now, you can only select one. So there's only one answer, and it's the one that best fits you. So with that in mind, I'm about to launch the poll. And you'll see it come up here in just a second. Poll number one. And there it is. And you now have time to go ahead and put your answers in. Oh, it's populating quickly. Very good. Keep going, folks. We got about over 40% that have answered the poll going up higher. Close to 50% of you have answered the poll. Wonderful. Keep going. We're at 60%. Wow, passing 70, 75% of you answered the poll. In just a few more moments, I'm going to close the poll, and we'll start our discussion. This looks pretty good. We've been at it for about a minute, so I'm going to close the poll. You'll see it says end poll. There we go. And I'm going to share the results with everybody. So watch your screen. And there they are. Launch. There we go. So why are you considering playing? It looks like the big winner there was probably number two with over 60, uh, almost 56% there. I've been in long-term transition and need to consider other income options. And if I could then, just jump in here, Michael. Sure, so actually, So everyone, this is actually why uh, Boomerworks was started a number of years ago. It was just after the last recession where there were a lot of, and still are, a lot of professionals over the age of 50 who find themselves in long-term transition and have only known W-2 options. And so we started this really mostly for all of you. Uh, it's certainly open to everyone at, at all, every stage of life, even, even different ages, but really for those who are in long-term transition. So, so thanks very much for joining us. We're, we're really glad you're here. And uh, the uh, other two that received the uh, uh, almost 20%, 19%, as you can see there, is I'm currently employed and uh, want either side income or future opportunities. And uh, I am or have, or have been uh, fully self-employed and want to refresh the game. Kind of interesting that the COVID thing really came in pretty low there. So uh, that's actually good to see, uh, I think. So I'm going to stop sharing the results on this one and move on. Uh, any other comments, Cher, about the, about the poll? I think, I think we're good to go. Let's jump right okay, in. Okay, all right. So here's our agenda for this evening. We've introduced you to the chat box. That's the place to put your questions. There's going to be more polls than the one you just did, and clearly people have figured out how to use it. We're going to talk about the trends in self-employment and uh, how that's changed, particularly in this new century. We're going to look at how you can take the skills you have in traditional W-2 work and repurpose them for your own career in self-employment. We want to help you think about how to get ready to launch such a career and provide you with uh, some partnership ideas through partnership discussions. So that's our general agenda. Sherry, you want to add any points here? No, I think we're, I think we're good. Let's just okay. jump in. Okay. So let's talk about the rise in self-employment in the current period of time. It may be surprising to people, but the truth of the matter is that 42 million of our fellow citizens are currently in the category of self-employment. And more than a third actually have higher earnings, higher incomes than those in traditional jobs meaning those in W-2 work. For those of you confused about W-2 and self-employment, look, W-2 is that nice little slip you get at the end of the year so you can fill out your income tax form. 
And, if, if, uh, if you're working for a traditional employer. If you're working for a traditional employer, yes. If you're going to go into self-work, we're going to see about 1099. We're going to talk about that later, so don't, don't worry about it at the moment. Now, it might be surprising as well that data from the U.S. Department of Labor uh, indicates that there are actually more older workers who are engaging in self-employment uh, than our younger counterparts. <clears throat> and at the bottom of the screen here, you see an article that will bring that into perspective for you if you'd like to read it. Again, at the end of this presentation, excuse me, <clears throat> we're going to let you know uh, how you can get copies of the slide and other resources from BoomerWorks. So don't worry about it now. We'll make sure that you have those things uh, before this evening uh, is complete. As I said, remember, if you have questions, put them in the chat. We're watching it. Now, we're engaged in a talent revolution. And this is what's changing in our lives. The fact of the matter is that new technology is advancing at an alarmingly fast rate. And the whole idea of globalization and market disruptions that have hit us uh, either uh, within our own communities, around the country, and around the world, it's all about a different way of seeing the market in which we're all going to engage. And a great desire for flexibility and agility in employment. And uh, that leads to this idea of uh, self-employment. Uh, as a real option for all of us to think about. Now, uh, again, at the bottom of the screen, you're going to find an article which speaks to this idea of the rising of freelance uh, work after the, uh, uh, the COVID-19 finally uh, does its thing. Uh, again, remember, you'll be able to go online, Find all these resources at the end so you don't have to be busy writing all this down or worrying about it over the, uh, over the next few minutes. And, and Michael, I'll just interject here that I recently, um, recently saw somebody write that, that all of this talent revolution, the technology, the globalization is actually really the industrial revolution of our time. It has changed the way that we work. And of course, post-COVID, you know, we're already seeing people shift to, to platforms like this. In fact, interestingly, this is a really good example. We at BoomerWorks, we've been having, Michael's actually been hosting a live uh, version of this for the last year in Laurel, Maryland. And we had, had been and, and still plan to uh, do some of these in person. And we were thinking, oh, well, one day, you know, we'll do sort of a, a virtual option like this. Well, sure enough, COVID threw us right into this because we had no other option. And look how many people we have here, 142 registrants tonight, which certainly we could not have fit into any normal facility. <laughs> so I so I think the employers are really um, you know, starting to get, get wind of this. And I think really things are going to change. It's going to create a, a lot of opportunities for remote remote workers and for freelance workers, virtual workers uh, than we've ever, we've ever seen before. Yeah, these changes are pretty remarkable. You know, technology, globalization, workforce, uh, and this need for lifelong learning. You know, we, we, we've heard all these phrases, but they're all coming together now uh, and making it more and more important for us to think about work in a new and different way. And, and self-employment is one of those options. I know personally, I never really thought much about self-employment. And my good friend Shara actually got me into it. And it's been a wonderful experience for me. And uh, I think once you, once you learn about it and take the steps, uh, this, could be, this could be one option for you, either as full-time employment or as a supplement to uh, the kinds of things you are already doing. We're also engaged, uh, if we want to move in this area, into thinking a little bit differently. Uh, like most of you, age 50 and above, uh, the shift to uh, a freelance or small business ownership uh, requires us to have a kind of mind shift. Most of us spend our careers working for somebody else. So uh, when you have an opportunity and you want to think about the mindset and you want to read a little bit more about this, I want to once again recommend to you that you go to boomerworks.org, 
look on the resource page, the number of articles and material there will really be helpful in helping you fix how you might look at this change uh, that's impacting us individually and as a society uh, as a whole. And, and I'll also jump in here to let everyone know that at the very end of this presentation, there's going to be a slide with a number of uh, suggested reading materials. Several books will be up there. One of them is actually called The Gig Mindset. It's by a gentleman named Paul Estes, E-S-T-E-S. -E so uh, look out for that when we're right at the end of the presentation. So what we're trying to say back to you is that uh, this shift requires some new thinking and understanding the new world of work uh, and, uh, and uh, how it is that we individually and collectively uh, fit into it. We need to think of, uh, through the, uh, that we've all learned and used in our W-2 work and see uh, how it is that we can transfer them uh, to the self-employment uh, option or journey uh, that you might be on. In just a short little period of time, Cher is going to actually walk you through an exercise uh, to help you with this process of thinking through the kind of skills that you've earned and learned and how they can be repurposed uh, in, uh, in a self-employment uh, world. <clears throat> also, uh, I want to mention that uh, there is a real opportunity here for very significant income. Uh, and you can, you can, by the work you decide to do, either build a, a side position or a full-time job. And it is work that you've always wanted to do, this great idea of such meaningful work that is yours. So... Between the, mind sh the mindset shift, repurposing of your W-2 skills, and this wonderful opportunity to have a steady income and meaningful work uh, that is important to you is all part of the journey uh, towards self-employment. Now, no journey comes uh, without, uh, without work. So let's talk for just a few moments about uh, this idea of your experience being your expertise. All of us have learned skills over the years that we use. Some of those skills came from our work. Some of those skills come from our volunteer activity or our faith community uh, work or our hobbies, our volunteerism and the like. Together, all those things are a series of skills that make up the body of our work that could be repurposed in a self-employment context. Some of them we got paid for, and some of them we didn't get paid for, but nonetheless, they were all jobs. Anybody that's ever coached a kid's team, <coughs> excuse me, done volunteer work at a food bank or at your church or synagogue, all of these things, have a kind of job that some of them you just don't get paid for. And, <clears throat> excuse me again, and all of these collectively are the components of a career, not only the one you have, but the one you could have. And that becomes your journey to self-employment. So from all these rich sources of learning, uh, you gain communications, facilitation, some personal joy, and they're a collection of community and faith engagements that make up your expertise. And in an exercise, as I mentioned, that Cheryl will walk you through in just a little bit, <clears throat> you'll have an opportunity to see how it is that you might transfer those, uh, those pieces to the self-employment platform. Excuse me. I don't have anything, folks. I just have a frog in my throat. So let's think about this self-employment journey. Now, look, in any new activity, there are advantages and there are challenges. So <clears throat> we've listed here some advantages and some challenges that might occur. I'm just going to walk through these relatively quickly, and then we're going to take a poll 
to see where you fit in and our group fits in uh, with these various advantages or challenges. First, on the advantage side, there's this wonderful opportunity to reinvent yourself, to have a flexible schedule like you've always hoped for, income potential that you determine. It's not determined by somebody in the HR office somewhere. Uh, you have this opportunity to create multiple streams of revenue, multiple streams of, of revenue. I can tell you for myself, when I started this, I'm sorry about that, folks. Let me make sure that that ends. Okay. Uh, there are multiple opportunities uh, for revenue streams. When I started in this thing, I was really just doing training for boards of directors. That's about the only thing I did, the not-for-profit boards of directors. Today, I have a speaking career. I still do the training. I do coaching. And I have publications that I sell. So what started out as one focus has led to multiple revenue streams uh, in my own case. And I'm sure as you begin this journey, you'll find similar things in your own path. The nicest thing is you pursue the thing that is that you're most passionate about. That's a great, great advantage. And on the other side, think of it this way. You're not going to have to put up with all that office politics when you're talking to yourself. So those are some of the advantages. <clears throat> on the other side, of course, there are challenges in any new uh, venture. So one of them is, as I mentioned before, you know, income is an issue and you're not going to get paid on the 1st or the 15th or every other Friday. A lot of it has to do with your own ability to generate income. And that means that you need to have sales skills, which you probably have, may know well, or may not. And, you know, you're going to have to make some investment. It may not be a huge investment, but you're going to have to make some investment. So there could be a loss of some personal savings along the way. And if you are like most people, myself included, uh, risk is something that's hard to take, particularly when you're considering your family. You may have children that are getting ready to go off to college. Uh, you may have uh, sick older parents uh, that you have to. So risk aversion is an issue that is a challenge for all of us. And crazy as it sounds, even though we know this to work very, very well, the truth is that sometimes we lack the full confidence we need to make that tick. And on the, and on the other side, if you've worked in the W-2 world most of your life, you're pretty used to your employer determining your benefits. They may pay for some of them. You may pay for some of them. There may be some joint payment of benefits, but they have a list and that's usually what you get. And of course, you're going to have to take a journey where you're going to be responsible for all that on your own. And of course, you have to find people to buy your service or your product. So you're going to have to learn uh, to find your clients. So with that in mind, Actually, Michael, if I can jump right in before oh, you yes, take the call. Sure. <laughs> so actually, earlier in the chat, somebody asked about ageism. Um, is that a factor? To what extent is that a factor? And I actually want to put that in the advantage column rather than the challenge column, surprisingly. Uh, and here's why. Um, when one is looking for traditional W-2 employment, a regular J-O-B, like most of us have had in our lives, that actually is where ageism really plays that, which is actually why Boomer Works exists. Uh, because there's still a lot of it in this, in this country um, and actually around the world. And, and generally speaking, most employers tend to hire people between the ages of 25 and 45. They may not admit it, they may not say it publicly, but that's generally what happens. Even actually recent grads get discriminated against the other side, but we're not talking about them today. <laughs> today we're talking about seasoned folks. Um, but because of that, right, um, when you look at the other side, when you look at self-employment, the reverse happens because when a person is self-employed, there's sort of this implied sense of credibility. And as we know, with age, with seasonedness, tends to come more credibility, right? That sense of, hey, you know what you're doing. 
So if anything, gray hair or colored gray hair <laughs> can be an advantage. Um, because then the, the employer is not necessarily looking at your resume. In fact, they hardly ever look at your resume. They look at your skills. They look at your experience. And if you have been, um, if you have been working for any length of time, chances are you have honed some very specialized skills and you can come in with more expertise, more gravitas, more credibility than you could when you were in your 20s, right? So I just want to encourage you. This is a, a fantastic time in life to be thinking about self-employment when you are more successful. You know, sure, I've had this, uh, this uh, white head since I was 34 years old. At one time, it made me look older. Now I'm just old, you know, so <laughs> one of those things you got to deal with in life. So we want to do a, a, another poll here, and it's a quick poll. We're going to do two of them, but here's the first one. We want you to think about your biggest, the biggest advantage to self-employment. And we're going to categorize it in six ways here. Those that were on the previous slide. So that's the freedom to reinvent, the flexible schedule, the potential income, the new revenue streams, your passion, and the ending of office politics. So give me a moment. We're going to... And remember, you can just choose one. So what's the biggest, your biggest yeah, advantage? Right. Yeah, that you, you only, you only or get the thing one. that you're really excited most about. Yeah, so we don't want to do that. We want to go to the second poll. There we go. We're going to launch the poll here in a couple seconds, so be ready. There we go. It should be showing up on your screens. Wow. Go for it, folks. And just a reminder to put yourself on mute. We're up at about 65% moving up. There's 70, 72. Great. Keep going, folks. Okay, we're at uh, over 75%. I'm going to shut the poll down here in a couple seconds. And there we go. The poll is ended. And now I'm going to share the results with the crowd. And let's see what we have. Well, look at this. So that thing we mentioned earlier, the idea of having your own schedule, that seems to be pretty high on the agenda here. Uh, along with the ability to pursue your own passion. They're, you know, statistically, they're, they're one and two there. Uh, and I guess the next big one is this idea of uh, potential multiple streams of revenue, so you're not stuck with, uh, with one opportunity. <laughs> and I guess office politics still does play a role for some people. Uh, let's walk through these and see if we have any additional thoughts. Uh, Sherry, you want to you want to share some of your thoughts? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I, I think the the um, the pursue your passion. It's actually one of my passions <laughs> is to help people find theirs. And I'm not surprised that that actually took a chunk of of your responses because so often we get stuck in W two roles where we are doing work that employers have sort of constrained us to do. You know, at the end of the day, we're all about, we need to solve somebody else's urgent problems, right? That's what we do in work. Well, when you're in a very structured W-2 job, you don't really get to control the kind of work that you're doing. To a very, very small degree, you have to stay within your rubric, you've got to stay within your lane, don't step on somebody else's toes, you got to stay within the job description, more or less. And so when you, when you explore self-employment, all those boxes are completely released, right? You get to actually pursue something that you are uh, potentially passionate about, which of course leads to all these other things, right? Freedom to reinvent and, and different income streams. So it's just interesting that the folks are picking up on that. Yeah, and if you have some personal thoughts on this, why don't you go ahead, go into the chat and mark those down. And as I said, we have a couple people that are taking a look at them. We'll kind of wrap them up at the end and, and uh, try to share more of that out. So now that we've looked at what the uh, biggest advantage is, obviously, uh, you know, there is 
some set of challenges. And we've categorized these in seven fields, as you can see, the unstable income, lack of selling skills, uh, potential loss of some personal revenue, uh, the, uh, uh, the risk aversion item that we mentioned, whether or not you have the self-confidence to uh, move it forward. The idea that, you know, someone else has always provided the benefits in one form or another, and now you're going to have to think about that for yourself. And this whole idea of finding clients. So take a good look at it, and we'll get ready to launch the next poll. Let's do that. And it should come up on your screen in just a moment there. Okay, the poll is open. Go for it. Once again, we'd like to remind everybody uh, to mute your own phone. It saves a lot of a lot of back back noise. <laughs> All right, we're up over seventy percent. Still pushing a little bit. There we go, seventy-five. I'm about to close off the poll here. We got 76% moving up. I'm going to close off the poll now. There's 77. And end the poll. Okay. And now we're going to share the results with you. So let's take a look at this. Well, not surprisingly, finding clients, you know, someone to buy your product or service. Uh, does often come up uh, high on the list, as does this idea of uh, not having a regular paycheck, uh, you know, coming in. Uh, yeah, if I could just interject here, this is exactly why most people stay with W-2 jobs, right? Because the, the organization that you're working for, they're doing the selling for you, and they're also paying you a steady paycheck. Now, of course, there is the safety in that, but as we know, and especially having this conversation right now, you know, in what's happened in the last six weeks, that um, that low risk on your on 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 your side um, is actually um, becomes a low reward on your side because we see how quickly your job can evaporate, right? When when sales are in their control and the paycheck is in their control, when they lose a client, you can lose your job. Whereas when you're self-employed, even though um, it's a higher risk potentially, right, in terms of unstable income and you needing to find clients, technically speaking, you can always get another client. You don't have to fire yourself, right? Because there's always <laughs> another way to reinvent. There's always another product or service that you can offer. You can always get more income, where and you don't have to be limited by whether or not an employer thinks that they can afford you as a line item in their payroll. Right. So there definitely is a, a plus, and, you know, a pro and a con to it. But we really want to encourage you to be thinking about how can you um, always have, even if it's just on the side, um, as the millennials would say, the side hustle <laughs> or a side gig, um, how can you keep that income coming in and not have to rely upon whether the employer thinks that you're worth the risk of, of keeping on board, um, depending on the economy? Yeah, I know in my own case, the idea of finding people who wanted to buy my service was a real scare. Uh, but, you know, through networking, learning to use LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and uh, uh, email, and all these, the magic of technology these days, uh, slow but sure, you know, things moved around. And now I have plenty of clients to work from. I joined some groups, you know. Uh, Nothing that really cost very much money, I might add. So uh, uh, I understand this thing about finding clients, but that has also to do with uh, with this issue of uh, uh, whether or not uh, you've clearly figured out what it is that you're selling. You know, what's the focus of the work you're going to do? 
And uh, that's part of this journey and part of the work that you will need to do in order to be successful uh, in the self-employment arena. Yeah, and so something I'm, we're going to be talking about in a minute, sorry to interrupt, Michael, no, um, is, is, is to what extent is the product or service that you're selling monetizable, meaning that you're offering something that somebody, number one, feels that they need and that they want to pay for. Not just that they need to pay for, but that they actually want to spend the money to do. And, and in different economies, that changes, right? But at, the, but at the same time, if the more flexible you can be to repurpose your skills and look out into the market and say, huh, what do people really re need right now? And to what extent does that align with what I'm able to offer? Them? So we'll, we'll be talking about that more um, as we do some exercise. So I'm going to close out that poll, get it off the screen for you. And uh, I'm going to turn over the next part of this, uh, uh, this presentation to Shara. Uh, we'll be back. I'll be watching the chat for a little while myself. Uh, Cher, it's all yours. Thanks. All right. So this is, uh, we're jumping right into this section because this is a question that we often get. It's the sort of basically, wait, what? What do I do with taxes? What? What's all this terminology? 1099, W2, all of this. Now, first of all, full disclosure, I am not an attorney. I am not an accountant and I do not play either on TV. Okay. So let me just put that as a disclaimer. I'm going to be sharing with you uh, the bit that I know Certainly, there is a lot of information out there. In fact, you can see even on this particular slide, which I put up there, there's an article on our, on our website, and it's from a um, website called upcouncil.com that talks about the difference between independent contracting LLCs, the SBA, the Small Business Administration. Uh, they have a core free course. There's all kinds of information you can find, but just at a high, high level. Really, the, the difference between being an employee and, a, and an independent contractor, just from a technical perspective, is that when you're an employee, you receive a W-2 tax form at the end of the year. It lists your earnings, your withheld, your, your taxes, your FICA, pay all of that, right? And it's done for you, and it's a one-and-done kind of a thing. When you're an independent contractor, you're going to receive, and I'm going to put a caveat in this, not everybody will, but most of you will receive a 1099 tax form, and then it's going to list the total income um, that was generated per company, per client, okay? So you're gonna get multiples of these. And it's not gonna show tax deductions because the, employer, the, uh, because the employer that you're working for is not paying them. That's your responsibility. So one of the, uh, the best practices that most accountants will say is just automatically lop off a third of whatever you're taking in and set it aside for taxes. Um, pre preferably the IRS wants you to pay them quarterly. If you pay them at the end of the year, you'll get a little bit of a penalty. You can still do it. Um, but try not to dip into it if, you, if, if, if at all possible. And the reason why I said there's a disclaimer that you may not get a 1099 is if you choose to be an S-Corp, and I'm going to go to this next slide here. I hope I can still do that. Maybe not. Uh, Michael, I thought oh, I could. see you. Whoops. Hmm. Ah, well, wait. we're going to take care of that. <laughs> a technical glitch here? Just a minor little detail. Just Let's see if we can get back to we're, we're remote control. Here. slideshow. Whoops, didn't want to, there we go. Okay, sure. thank you. You should have it now, I think. You should have it. Let's see. Ah, there, there you it is. Go. Great. Okay. So, so here, um, the, the, why I mentioned that some of you are not going to get a 1099 is actually in the right column here is if you um, are an S corporation. If you're an S corporation, uh, that means that you are the employee of your company. I happen to be an S-Corp. It was actually what my accountant su um, suggested that, that I do. In fact, he believes that all small businesses should be S-Corps. You don't have to be. But as an S-Corp, you file personal taxes. You can claim what's called a reasonable wage. And then the remaining, uh, your remaining income goes on what's called a case statement. So let's just say uh, you, make, you, you earned $100,000 total. You could claim a reasonable wage. You could do in your account and figure out what that is. Let's just call it 50,000. And then the remaining 50 would go on a case statement. And the reason why that's helpful is because you're actually taxed at two different rates. You're still taxed on everything, but you're not taxed on everything altogether as you would be with an LLC. An LLC, all, you, all of your incomes gets taxed at one rate. So the higher you, you earn, the, the bigger your tax rate. S-Corp um, is, is not that way. S-Corps do cost a little bit more to set up than an LLC. That's why some people choose the LLC. But then the other side of it, on the green side, on the left side of this, this slide, is sole proprietorship. Right now, if any one of you here is not an LLC and you're not an S-Corp, 
and you just decide to go and you know, do some gig work, do some freelancing or whatever, you are a sole proprietor, meaning all you need to do is list your social security number on the 1099 form and you're in business. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to register the state. You're already in business, which is the easiest way to get started for sure. Um, however, it doesn't offer you any legal protection. That's one of the main reasons why you go with an LLC or an S corp. You incorporate so that the corporation is taking the hit should there, God forbid, be anybody suing you, uh, then it's not you personally, whereas as a sole proprietor, um, you're, you're taking the risk. Most people are not taking a big risk because hopefully you're going to be offering services that you feel pretty confident in. So you, you should be okay. But again, it's, you definitely want to talk to a professional, uh, an attorney and or um, an accountant. You may want to even just go on legal Zoom. That's a, another way to go. But there are a lot of uh, places that can help you. Also, I uh, did want to mention, so on the IRS website, you can see here has a, um, some business structures you can look at. And uh, well, we have another slide later on, but it, um, it'll show you where you can go and get in touch with uh, what's called the, your, small, your local small business development center, otherwise known as the SBDC. Most every city in our country has one. In fact, here in the DC area, we have multiple. We have the Alexandria SBDC and Fairfax and Arlington, and I think there's Rockville and all over. And that actually, that organization, it's a, it's a, it's a government agency and it offers you free advice. In fact, when I got started back about a decade ago, that's where I went. I went to the Alexandria SBDC and I sat down with a counselor there and they gave me all kinds of information. They referred me to uh, different professional services. I got my accountant there and I got, you know, different ones and I got a lot of great advice. So there's a lot of free resources out there for you uh, to tap in, into. Uh, and by the way, just as a, as a side, on the right side, other business ventures, as you see, C Corporation and partnerships, those are, are generally reserved for, for larger entities. And hopefully this will work. I'm trying to go to the next slide. <laughs> oh, Michael, I wish this was working better. Let's try this again. I'm so sorry. All right. All right. So we're here. All right. So here we go. So now we're really going to jump into the weeds. Um, so now we've gotten the 1099 stuff out of the way. So we're going to give you an opportunity here to start repurposing your W-2 professional skills. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have been in the workforce in a traditional job for any length of time, which most people on this call have been 20, 30 plus years, um, in a, either a certain profession, maybe you've had multiple professions, maybe you've had multiple industries that you've worked for, you have accumulated, accumulated a wealth of skills. Now, they might have been uh, categorized under certain titles, director of this, manager of that, vice president of the other, that you may or may not have had any control over. But I can tell you that you have amassed a lot of skills, some of which might be even be hidden to you. And one of the things that we're going to start doing here in our next slide is we're going to be looking at how can you repurpose what you already have to reinvent yourself into potentially something new and different. Now, I say potentially because there might be those of you on this call that actually love doing what you've always been doing and you just want to do the self-employed version of that. That's fine and that's great. I would dare to say though, I've, I've done these sessions enough to know that the good majority of you are looking to break free and say, oh, finally, I can have an opportunity to do something that I've always wanted to do, but you may not know what that is. So here's an exercise that'll help you do that. Okay, so I call this exercise passiontivity. Now, here, I just need to make an aside. There are a number of you on this call who have either worked with me before or have seen me do this. Even if you've done passiontivity before, I highly encourage you to do it again. Why? Because things change. You change, I change, we all change, and, and, your, and your interests might change. So this is a great chance to redo it. And so what you're going to do is you're going to grab that handy piece of paper and a pen or pencil, and you're going to draw two perpendicular lines uh, down and across the page. And you're going to label the top line. Okay, uh, Mike, I think, I think we'll need to, I think I just need to uh, drive here. Okay, so high motivations at the top, low motivations at the bottom, high skill is on the right, and low skill is on the left. And what I'm gonna do now is walk you through what these four quadrants are, and then we're gonna do a brief exercise, okay? So what this is, is it's looking at where your skills and your career motivators align, and figuring out how can you take this information and then repurpose it into, um, into self-employment. By the way, you can do this if you were just looking for a W-2 job as well. 
I'm one of my practice areas is career coaching. I use this with all of my clients all the time. And we just do this for normal career, career trajectories, but it's wonderful also for, uh, for self-employment. So in the upper right is high engagement. Now, now this is the juicy box. This is really where you're going to want to concentrate. So these are skills where you feel you are a rock star. You know it. Everybody knows it. And you love to do this work. I mean, wild horses can't drag you away from this stuff. You give discretionary effort. If you were independently wealthy, you'd still do this kind of work, okay? And we're talking about hard skills, not soft skills. I'll just give you a brief definition. People have different definitions, but this is the quick and dirty one. Um, we're looking at hard skills, meaning functional skills, things that you do. So that could be project management, that could be financial analysis, that could be customer engagement, that could be research and development. There's a million different, um, probably more than a million <laughs> different kinds of hard skills. Um, I'm not looking here for your soft skills. Your soft skills could be how you do it. So we're, I'm not looking for you to write down that you're analytical or strategic or great with people. You might very well be those things, but that doesn't really give context for this exercise. And this, this, for this exercise to work well, you really, really need to focus on what you do, not how you do it. And I'll explain why in just a minute. So high motivation is upper right. And looks like I'm still having some difficulty here with, a, a, here we go. Bottom right, stopgap work. What do I mean by that? Well, these are skills that you have, hard skills that you have. You're perfectly, you know, competent in them. And no one would deny that, not even you, but it doesn't exactly wake you up on Monday morning. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's the kind of thing that employers will continue to give you in a traditional W-2 job, because you're never going to complain. You're going to be a good foot soldier. You're not going to roll your eyes other than internally. <laughs> um, but it just doesn't really light you up. And oftentimes what will happen in a W-2 job is all, your high motivation, high skill, high skill, low motivation, all of that gets wrapped up in one big job. And your employer, your, your hiring manager, typically does not take the time to pull that apart with you to say, what do you love to do and what don't you love to do? So all of it kind of gets jumbled together. And on the upper left is professional development. So those are areas where you're highly motivated to succeed, but you don't necessarily have the skill yet. Now, I will say in, um, as a slight, uh, a slight distinction in this box, they're really, and I didn't put this in the slide to break it out, but there's really to me two sides of this box. There's what I call the want to skills and the need to skills. What do I mean? It's all professional development. You're not particularly skilled at it, but in the want to side, you really want to get better at it. In other words, it's a get to. It's a wow, that would be amazing, as opposed to the need to, which is the should. All right, so let me give you an example. So let's say you're in marketing and you say, wow, I'd love to be better at social media strategy. That's a want to. And of course, a marketing person might very well say that. But on the need to side, they might say, and by the way, a lot of marketing professionals are not particularly good with numbers. A lot of communicators not very good with numbers. So the person say, I need to be better at managing budgets. Sorry. <laughs> or some people might say, I need to be a better public. <laughs> okay, so the need to and want to are two different things, but they're both professional development. And then we have disengagement, right? That's the Right. Low skill, low motivation, ixnay on that. It's, it's you're not skilled, not interested in it. It's the opposite of your high high. So here's what I'd like you to do for the sake of time when you're not going to go through all four boxes right now, but I'd like to give you a minute or so. I know that sounds like no time whatsoever, but I want this to be very, very organic. Okay. And I, all I want you to do is just fill out the high motivation, high skill box. Now, this is important if you, if you take time to do this for a minute because. The next two exercises, we're going to build on that. Okay, so I, so again, the instructions are: look at your hard skills, things you're great at, and this could be from any time in your career. It could be professional skills, it could be hobbies, uh, volunteer work that you've done. As long as it's a skill, I'll give you a quick example. Um, so I do a lot of volunteer work, and uh, typically when I've been on chapter boards and things, uh, for some reason I end up I end up as like the, the programs chair, okay? And I end up doing a lot of meeting planning. Now I'm not a meeting planner in my day job, but I developed some skills and I actually really enjoyed it, okay? So that's a skill I possibly could put down somewhere if I were doing passion activity for myself. So as long as it's something you've done, even if you haven't gotten paid for it, it goes it goes there. So uh, maybe five, six, seven things. Uh, so go ahead and take a minute and I'll let you know when, when the time is up.
And by the way, these could be strategic skills, they could be tactical skills, big skills, small skills, it doesn't matter as long as it is meaningful to you. Okay, let's come back. So now that you have that done, and, and I really would encourage you to, um, to, to fill out the rest of it um, uh, as you go back. Michael, I'm, I'm stuck again here. If you could help me out to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so now we're gonna, we're gonna go a little bit deeper. And the first thing we're gonna do is talk about something that I call an ing skill. What in the world is that? Well, it'll make sense in a second. So. This ing skill, I actually, what you just wrote in that high skill, high motivation box are a bunch of ing skills, things you do, writing, event planning, financial analysis, that kind of thing. Not necessarily an ing, but you get the, the point. It's something that you do. But we're gonna help you right now turn this, some of those ing skills into, oh boy, stuck again, here we go. And oh, <laughs> Michael, can you take me back for a sec? Mm-hmm. Trying to do this remote sharing, didn't work so well, okay. So we're gonna turn this into an er business. So writing is the skill, writer is the business. Event planning is the skill, event planner is the business. Pretty straightforward, right? Most people don't think of this because you're not normally given the opportunity to think this way because somebody else is doing your er. They're calling you a director, vice president of XYZ, and you normally can't repurpose your skills in a whole new business. And I wanna give you a real example that I love, a story that I love to share. It was a, a coaching client of mine a number of years ago named Jacqueline. And she came to me as, and just for career co regular career coaching. She was a regular W2 employee, wasn't necessarily thinking of going on her own. She was the president of a, a nonprofit. And when I had her do the passiontivity uh, in her high skill, high motivation box, she put what you might think a nonprofit president would put, board relations, and she put, you know, budgeting and operations and this and that and, and in, in and among them she just sort of listed event planning. It was just about a list of about seven different items. So I said okay Jacqueline now that you've done that I want you to take a, a new lens. I want you to go just over the high high box high skill high motivation. I want you to look at those in skills and let me know if you if any of those skills jump off the page to you as ones that you love doing so much that you could actually see yourself doing it full-time, repurposing that one thing to do that full-time. If I gave you permission, what would you do? And within about 32 seconds, she just lit up. She, her eyes got big. She almost jumped across the table and she said, event planning. I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, no, you don't understand. She said, donor events. I said, what? She said, I am so good at planning donor events, fundraising events. She said, I have other nonprofit colleagues in my region who reach out to me on a regular basis and say, Jacqueline, would you help us plan our donor event? She says, I love it. She goes, we raise more money than you can shake a stick at. We have people laughing and crying and this thing and that thing. And I said, wow. I said, I said, Jacqueline, I said, you didn't talk to me for this reason, but do you think maybe, you know, you could consider doing this as a full-time job, as a, as a, as a, you know, as a, your own business? She goes, absolutely. Well, in a matter of time, humanimpactevents.com was born. Okay. And that was all because of this exercise. And that's why I focus so much on the ing and the earth uh, concept, because this gives you this rich opportunity to take all the skills that you have, whether you've been paid for them or not, and repurpose them. And it may not be just one thing. It may be multiple things. So it might be that you cobble together this cast role of work where you do a bunch of different kinds of freelancing. Maybe you do some writing and some event planning and some bookkeeping and, and what and closet organizing, <laughs> whatever you want to do. Uh, you don't necessarily have to put it all under the rubric of one solid business. You could have multiple practice areas that could be disconnected. Now, a lot of people do choose to put it under one rubric, like I, I'm sort of a workforce person, so I'm a recruiter and a career coach. I do some team building and executive coaching and diversity work and this and that. Michael does all kinds of work with associations. I mean, I do too, but he, he does it in a different way. He works with boards and all of this. So both of us have brands that fit in a particular sector, but you don't necessarily have to do that if you have multiple um, in skills that you want to verify, if I can say it that way, um, you can take them and you can cobble them together and you don't necessarily have to have one, one brand. Um, okay, Michael, if you could help me out. 
the next slide. Thanks. All right, so let's go ahead and inventory your skills again. Like we're gonna, now we're gonna, now we're gonna take this and, and, I, and like, I'm gonna give you another, another chance to go silent. So here's your, the ing skills that you enjoy, right? Take it from your high skill, high motivation box. Now what I want you to do is I want us to think about this first. So I'm gonna give you another minute here. Actually, I don't even need to have to give you a minute. I think you'll be able to figure this out in about 15 seconds, but I won't we'll, we'll give you a little longer than that. I'd like you to take a look at this list. You probably have already done it as I, as I was talking and see, are there any skills in your high skill, high motivation box that jump off the page to you where you're like, wow, if I could have the opportunity to do this thing full time, I'd love it. And by the way, don't limit yourself by your, by your perceived lack of knowledge. Because number one, you know more than you think you do. And guess what? We should be continuous learners anyway. So maybe uh, like me, let's just say you were like me and you had, a, you did meeting planning on the side. You never did it for, you know, full time. You recognized you had a talent in it and it was kind of interesting to you. Take a class. You know, there are all kinds, do all, you, YouTube University, right? <laughs> you can go and learn online. There are all kinds of ways for you to build your skills. Don't limit yourself by the fact that you've never actually had that as a full time. Okay, so let me just give you a few, few more seconds to, to think about it, and then we'll go to the next one. Just circle any of those ing skills that you really feel could be a her business. Okay, and the next thing you wanna do is look at your passions or hobbies. Now, this gets really interesting because um, there's what you do, and then there's who you do it for, and, and even the kind of sector maybe that you wanna work in. So maybe you have a passion for the environment, or maybe you have a passion for, I don't know, you have an interest in commercial real estate, whatever. You might have this, this interest in, in some sort of um, sector or field, or maybe it's been a hobby. You've, um, you know, you're a gardener, you're a photographer, whatever you are on the side that maybe you can repurpose into uh, something new. And I'm going to give you an example in, in a minute here. Sorry, we're trying to get this done here. <laughs> and then the last thing is, which can you monetize? Oh, we back up, uh, Michael. We're not quite quite ready for that one yet. You have to write it. Uh, so want to, want to be thinking about what you can monetize. So once you've figured out what your what your ink skills are, what any errors that you have and any passions that you have, and you're going to put it all together and say, who wants to pay for what I want to sell? So for example, okay, so let's just say writing is your high skill, high motivation. Let's say your er is freelance writer. Let's say environmental conservation is your passion. Then maybe you can write articles for environmental nonprofits, right? Maybe accounting or budgeting is your ing skill. Um, sorry, Michael. I think I think maybe what needs to happen is um, if you could uh, lift lift off of the cursor. Oh, maybe I can I can still do this. Okay, then maybe bookkeeper, right, is the er version. Volunteering with elderly populations maybe is a hobby or passion you've had. So maybe you can do bookkeeping services for nursing homes. You see how that all fits together? It's, it's, a, it's a fairly straightforward kind of thing. Now, you have to do some research, you have to put your noggin on, you gotta be thoughtful about this, you gotta be thinking, okay, well, not only what do I wanna do and what am I interested in? But are, what kind of organizations might benefit from and find value from the thing that I actually want to offer? That's why it might be helpful for you to look at different kinds of ER skills to see um, if there are multiple, multiple practice areas that you can have. You may want to try things out, test it out. You don't necessarily have to stick with one thing um, all at once. Okay. Now, once you've kind of gone through that particular exercise, you do want to define your target market. So this is a broad, broad concept. And a lot of you are probably familiar with this, that there are three major types of markets that you can go after. You can, be, um, you can go to do what's, what's called B2C, which is business to consumer, meaning you as a company are selling to an individual or multiple individuals. And if you do that, you're going to need to focus on demographics. So for example, in one of my practice areas, which is career coaching, I have a B to C model, meaning working with individuals like yourself. The demographic, well, number one, professionals. Okay? I only work with, with professionals. 
and I work with people who are in some sort of transition, right? Whether they want to advance their career internally or externally, but they, they, they fit sort of a demographic. B2B, business to business, is where I as a business work with another business and I have that practice area too. Now, like Michael, I actually work often with associations and I tend to do recruiting for them. Uh, sometimes I do trainings, uh, some versions of team building and, and, and coaching and things, but, but the employer is the one who's actually paying me which is different than B2G, business to government. Now, if you're going to do B2G, which is a whole topic unto itself, and actually I know that there are people on this call who have deep expertise in that, um, that is not a light thing. <laughs> a lot to that. And the government doesn't work with just anybody, and they don't pay just any rates. There's a whole other conversation about it, but uh, if, you, if you are going to go in that direction, you may want to target a certain sector within the government. Maybe it's defense, or maybe it's uh, you know USDA, or or the sciences like NIH or SAMHSA. Uh, maybe you have a product or service that is going to be very, very relevant to that particular sector. But I, I would highly encourage you, if you're, if you're thinking of doing business with the government, do research. Um, we're not gonna talk about it anymore tonight. Not, no time for that. Uh, plus it's not my, my or Michael's expertise other than to say, you gotta go check it out because it's, 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 it's pretty, pretty complex. Um, but broadly speaking, you want to be thinking about how do you want to sell. Now, for those of you who are on this, on this call um, that do not want to do e-commerce, in other words, you want to be a consultant, for example, you want to offer that kind of service, more than likely you're going to have a B2B business. You are going to be selling to another organization. It could be a small, medium, or large organization. It could be in different sectors. You might just sell to commercial real estate or just sell to, uh, to environmental nonprofits or like we do to trade associations. But um, at some point, you're going to really want to focus on an industry, especially if you already come from that industry. It's one of the best and easiest ways to pivot when you already have deep expertise serving an industry. I, I, I call industries tribes, okay? You've served a tribe, uh, so you're in, you've been in higher education your whole career or most of your career, or you've been in financial services or IT companies, what have you. You probably know how to speak their language. You probably know what's keeping them up at night. And when you do that, you suddenly have more credibility, which is why I focus my own business in associations because I started out doing recruiting for associations. So it made sense when I started my own business. I already knew the sector. I knew the lingo. I knew the urgent problems. I had instant credibility, but I don't sell to hospitals. I don't sell to you know, consumer packaged goods companies. I don't sell to government contractors. Those are not my people. My people are associations. And I think a lot of you can relate to this probably where you come from a certain sector and are, are able to relate to them in a certain way. And let's see if this works again. Michael, I think I'll need your help. Okay, thank you. So questions to launch on your self-employment journey. This is, this is now we're getting a little bit more brass tacks. Um, and uh, let's see. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us here. Okay, so the first question is, what are the urgent problems someone would want to pay me to solve? This is the, 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 the top question. You cannot move off the dime until you get this question answered. That is gonna take some research. It's gonna be taking some thinking, but I wanted to emphasize this concept of urgent problems and here's why. Notice I didn't just say what problems would someone want me to pay, to, one, someone would wanna pay me to solve. The reason, just because someone has a problem doesn't mean it's urgent them, en enough for them to actually pay money to solve. So I'm gonna get personal here for a second. Um, and my husband and I just moved to a new home and uh, we have lovely neighbors and our neighbors very recently indicate, showed us that on our property, there's a dead tree that's bordering their property. Well, they're very nice about it, but they'd like that tree removed. And we're like, okay, well, we'll you know, consider it. And then the other day, my husband's talking to, the, uh, to uh, a vendor that um, the neighbor uses, turns out it's a tree person. And the tree person comes up to my husband and says, um, you know, I can help you take down that tree because your neighbor said that, you know, he kind of wants that debt. Very nice. But now all of a sudden, the urgency went up. So what did my husband do? On the phone with tree companies the other day. So some tree company is going to get our business because it's a little more urgent for us than it was before because we want to be good neighbors, okay? So you've got to be thinking about the urgency, not just the problem. And let me just make one more note about that. In sales, we have this thing called a sales cycle. And sometimes it's a slow sales cycle and sometimes it's a fast sales cycle. 
the less urgent the problem, the longer the sales cycle. The more urgent the problem, of course, the shorter the sales cycle. And you want a short sales cycle. Trust me, you do. So that's the whole reason for the urgency. Okay, so which W2 skills can I repurpose to solve those problems? We've already started to talk about that, and this is where you can be thinking, all right, specifically of all the different earth skills that I want to do, which ones would I want to use? In what ways do you want to deliver the solutions? Now we're getting a little bit more brass tacks, okay? So especially for those who want to do any sort of um, B2B work, um, even B2C to some extent, you've got to be thinking about what is, um, what is, what is your delivery mechanism? Do you want to train? Do you want to coach? Do you want to consult? Do you want to, to go to somebody's home and do your practice there? Do you want to do everything online? Do you want to just write and not ever, ever have anybody see you? There's so many ways to deliver your solutions that how you deliver them will certainly impact you know, your enjoyment of the work. Um, it'll impact potentially your income stream. It'll impact how your customers engage with you. But, all, but that, that, the, the, the delivery of the solutions is just as important as anything else. And then there's the marketing. Now notice I didn't say sales, I said marketing. And marketing has everything to do with how you express your value. Because people are not gonna buy something that, from you that they don't value. A, they need to value it for themselves, but they need to value you. Because there's an old expression, I started and if you were live, I'm sure you could all finish it for me. People do business with people they know, like, and everyone's gonna say trust, okay? No like and trust, they gotta trust you. But that means you have to trust yourself and you have to trust that what you're offering is something of value. But again, it's got to be valuable to the people you're selling to. It can't just be valuable to you. Just because you're uh, a rising artist, let's say, and you paint the most beautiful pictures in the world doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be an audience there for you for who wants to pay you good money for it. So there has to be a market need and you have to have something valuable that aligns with that need. Michael, if you could help me out, thank you. And how much will you charge? Now, of course, this is the big, literally $25,000, $100,000 question, whichever number you like. Uh, and clearly, I can't go into too much detail on this here because this is a very generic conversation, other than to say, you got to do your research. And I want to give you an example of that in, in my, own, my own life. So when I started my business, uh, you know, I already had a model for recruiting, and I knew exactly how much recruiters should, be, should, should charge, and that was no problem. But then I wanted to start doing some speaking. And I thought I'd probably be a decent speaker, but I had absolutely no idea how much to charge. And so I called a colleague, her name is Sharon. And I knew Sharon knew a thing or two about a thing or two about speaking, about training, about keynoting, all of that. And she said, you know, Sharon, she said, there's a very big difference between trainer rates and keynote rates. And I said, huh? She says, oh yes, one is here and one is there. And I said, really? And she starts explaining it to me. And really, I mean, it is that much of a differential. And there's different price points depending upon what kind of business is, you know, wanting to hire the trainer versus the keynote. But I got schooled right away. Why? Because a colleague was willing to share with me her perspective. And then I started getting a better understanding as I talked to other colleagues who, want, who were in that business already, who over the years, frankly, helped me raise my rates. They showed me my own value. They showed me the value that I would be, the perceived value to the client. And little by little, I got more and more confident. And every time a colleague said, hey, Sherry, you should charge X, I swallowed really hard. I said, okay. And I did it. And even if I didn't get it, I still got something that was closer to it than I would have before. So, so having a peer group of people who, are, who do what you do or do similar things that you do can be super encouraging. Can give, you can get all kinds of tips and you can hopefully raise your fees because somebody else is going to give you a little light punch in the arm and say, you can do it, you can charge more. Okay? And I especially say that, by the way, to all the women on this call, because most of us do not value what we're worth. So let me just say, you are worth it. Go for it. Um, and then operations. How will you keep the business running? Again, that is a super big question. But I will say that for those who are uh, what we call solopreneurs, and I think a lot of you on this call will, would probably be that, meaning you're in business for yourself, you're not going to have any employees necessarily. You probably are going to have very, very minimal operations, especially if you're in something like consulting. Now, if you're in e-commerce, it's a little different because you're going to have to pay for certain kinds of technology. But if you're in a sort of a traditional solopreneur business, there isn't a whole lot that you're going to have to pay for. So for example, in my world, I pay for 
uh, Office 365, which is a cloud solution. It, 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 it hosts my email, my, all my data on my, on my hard drive and, and, and basically everything that I do on the web. Um, I pay a monthly fee to GoDaddy, uh, who hosts my website. Um, I pay for LinkedIn. I choose to do that because I'm a recruiter and a coach and I need that. Um, I pay for, um, for Zoom, for, for this, this platform. There's these various things that I pay for, but you know, and a, and a cell phone, right? So but that's, it's not, that's not, a, not a whole lot of expenses, relatively speaking. And these days, especially with everything virtual, your home is your office, okay? So it's a whole lot less expensive than you think to get up and running. Again, unless you, e-commerce, again, has some extra charges. And certainly if you ever wanted to do anything retail, franchising, anything with inventory, that's a very different story. But I think a lot of people on this call are probably gonna be um, in sort of the, the, the minor uh, expenses. And also, uh, not just the, from an expense perspective, but in terms of the type of technology that you're gonna need. Again, you gotta look at your business. You might need to make a little bit of an investment, not only financially, but in your learning curve, with all sorts of technologies that are coming up. And also think about, um, are you going to need any, any sort of administrative support? Literally, like in a virtual assistant, somebody to help you with admin. Probably not in the beginning, but you might. Um, accounting, right? I'm not an accountant. Again, don't play one in TV. That's the one thing that I outsource, and I make sure somebody else is handling my taxes. So just look at what you can handle yourself versus what you need to outsource. Um, Michael, if you could help me. Thank you. And other questions to consider for your business planning. So in the bottom of this slide, you'll see that we have something called um, the Boomerworks Lean Business Plan Template. It is a version of other kinds of business plan templates that we've sort of cobbled together. You can go to the site and you'll see it. And on that page, you'll see uh, these kinds of questions. What, what's more fleshed out than this? This is just for the sake of this slide. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through all of them. I just wanted to, sh to share with you. These are other kinds of more detailed areas that will help you flesh out your business um, in terms of helping to spread the word. And, you know, for, for example, just for example, I'm just gonna take number three, spread, spreading the word has to do with marketing. So some of you on this call, you know you're extroverts. You don't even play one on TV, you are that person. You are, you're, you're just a social butterfly and you love getting out there and you have no problem lighting up a room and doing networking and building relationships. Others of you, that is just, you know, a big fear. And so you may want to hide behind your computer, and that's okay. Uh, you may want to you may want to utilize social media more. Uh, you may want to may want to become a, more of a thought leader. You know, you may want to blog and write and and share with the world all of your great ideas, and that can actually build your brand or a combination thereof. And there's obviously other things that you can do for marketing, but just as an example, based on your personality, you may choose to market yourself differently. Um, also based on your skills, do you know how to write or not, right? <laughs> all, all these things matter. But, but I wanted you to understand that it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not like every business markets themselves the same way. A lot of it is very individual and personalized, okay? Um, and one, one, one last thing I want to mention about number nine. Well, how can I offer additional products and services to keep new revenue flowing? Always be thinking about how you can continue to add value in the market. Try not to get stuck on the one thing. What I, what I mean by that is even if you're doing, uh, you're offering a certain kind of service, like for example, for me, it was recruiting and coaching, that's sort of with the job seeker world, right? Well, be open, be listening to when a client says, hey, Sally, hey, Mark, could you help me with dot, dot, dot? Now, if that could you help, at the end of that sentence, you feel like, yeah, I could, or wouldn't be a big stretch for me. I, I could grow in there. I could, I could learn it. All of a sudden, your wheel expand. All of a sudden, you have other revenue streams. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go do, you know, become a software engineer if really you're a writer. Okay? Very different skills, unless you happen to have both of those abilities, but most people don't. So, for example, for me, yeah, when people say, sure, can you do some employee engagement work or some team building or executive, like, yep. I sure can. And I, and even when I didn't actually have that as a practice area, I grew into it pretty quickly. But I know myself. I'm not a benefits consultant. Don't want to do that one on TV either. Don't want to do compensation analysis. I'm not an HR person in the classic sense because that's not my wheelhouse. It's not my area of enjoyment. So I, I refer those types of businesses to other consultants, which is one of the ways to build your business is by having a, what we call alliance partners. People who do similar things to what you do, maybe they have been diagram with you a little bit, or maybe they serve the same industry, but in a different way. 
you pull them into your network and all of a sudden you're referring business to each other because you have trusted relationship. I do this, you do that, it's kind of similar. And we're marketing to the same kind of client and the client says, hey, if you can't do it, maybe you can. And so you're able to, to not only build your business, but you can build other people's businesses as well. So that's just sort of a, a, a quick one for you. Uh, Michael, next slide, great. Um, and so the type of self-employment, I'm just gonna go through this super quick. We've already touched on, on various things, but I do wanna address this idea of gig work, okay? You will hear that term a lot, the gig economy. Now, at Boomerworks, we actually used to brand ourselves that way, that we were about helping professionals to enter into the gig economy. But then we started to realize that there's a lot of confusion around that word, and here's why. If you right now were to Google that word, the term gig or gig economy, what you would typically see are articles that have to do with, um, you know, like Uber and Airbnb and that kind of thing. Nothing wrong with that, but that's a certain kind of gig work. It is not necessarily something that you would do because you want to. A lot of times people do that because they have to, maybe having nothing to do with their professional skills, but it's kind of what we call fast cash. Get in the car and of course, post COVID, who knows, I think those two industries are probably gonna be very disrupted, but that's a different story. Um, but, but you don't really have to put a lot of effort into those things. You just sort of pick up the fast cash. 1099 work, um, free, otherwise known as freelance work, freelance projects, again, um, that's sort of, it's short term. Um, you can piecemeal it together. You don't necessarily have to have one big brand. You can do a little event planning and a little writing and a little bookkeeping or whatever you want to do, project management. You can piece it all together, but it's, again, it's very short term. Um, Project-based consulting, that's a little different too, because when you can call yourself a consultant, typically speaking, you're saying to the employer, I have a deep area of expertise. And it is a, it's a project, and maybe a long-term project, but you are really putting yourself out there as a subject matter expert in something, or maybe a developing subject matter expert. Very different than if you're just gonna go, you know, redo somebody's website, or you're gonna go um, do sort of a short-term project. E-commerce, of course, is altogether different. That's where you're doing B2C, business to consumer. Uh, you know, Etsy and eBay, and you know, you could either join those kind of companies, you can start your own, you know, if you have that sort of, of interest of selling things or helping other people to sell things online. Uh, government contracting, we touched on retail products, right? Uh, if you ever wanted to go into the brick and mortar, which we know is, is sort of going by the wayside, and then there's multi-level marketing, like the uh, Mary Kay, would, it would be a, a very classic example of that. So you have a lot of different options here. Um, and yep, you can keep going, Michael. And then we have what's called the on-demand website. So if you, so in the previous slide where I mentioned 1099 freelance work, one of the ways you could potentially find business is through what's called an on-demand website. On this slide is just a smattering of the kinds of sites that I'm talking about. Some of you may have heard of these. Uh, so Upwork, which is kind of in the middle of the bottom, is the grand poobah, right? They're, they're, the, they're the big cheese. And really what this is about is uh, where these platforms have, have, have developed to match employers who need short-term, quick-hit freelancers to fill their need. Oftentimes, uh, in the B2B uh, situation, uh, an employer says, hey, I need someone to write an article. I need someone to redo my website. I need a graphic designer. I need a copywriter, those kinds of things. Uh, there's a group called Fiverr, which is off to the left. And uh, that has a lot of that too. But in Fiverr, uh, you can get some, not kidding, you can get someone to write you a song. And, and, and in Fiverr, everything is $5. Now, it could be a little bit more than that if you need more services, but $5. Now, why? And here is going to be the caveat on the other side of my, of my speaking about this. That on on-demand websites, these are international websites. You've got people all over the world who you, are, you as a freelancer are competing with. And most of the people who live in other parts of the world have lower costs of living than we do. Therefore, their rates go all the way down. Number one, number two, there's a ton of competition. Now, is it impossible to get gigs? No, there's, a, there's an art and a science to it. And there's an article I posted at the bottom here, 10 things I learned freelancing on gig platforms. This guy in this article, he happens to be a writer. So you just have to repurpose it for whatever you want to do. But what, one of the things that he mentioned, and I think is interesting for anybody on this call, even if you didn't want to use on-demand websites as a, as a means of income, is that he suggests that when you go and look at um, what kinds of jobs, freelance jobs, employers are posting, 
that will give you an idea of what the market demands. Very interesting. So if you just, you can just do random searches, like as if you were an employer, you can go in and you can sign up as a freelancer and just sort of look around and see, huh, what do people need? And what, what people, what, if you start seeing themes come, come about, you can then look at your own skills and say, huh, do, do I have a skill in that area? Is it something that I'm interested in? Maybe, just maybe, I can, I can actually uh, fill a market need, even if you decide not to use uh, the on-demand site. But I just wanted you to know that they're there. Uh, next, Michael. Ah. <laughs> Almost. All right, so we're gonna do a quick poll. Michael, if you wanna launch this, we have two questions, two polls, uh, the and they're different questions. They're slightly different questions. The first is, have you ever used an on-demand website? But the second is, have you ever landed a freelance job through an on-demand website? Two, two, two different things. So Michael, if you wanna launch the first poll, I would imagine we're not gonna have a whole lot of yeses and no, yeses here, but, oh, here we go. We have more than I expected, okay, good. All right, 65, so we have, all right, so about 25% of you have actually used a, an on-demand site. That would make a lot of sense. Okay, so let's end the polling. And now, uh, Michael, if you want to, um, if you want to share, share the results, let's go ahead and go to the second. Whoops. Oops. There we go. Okay. So let's go ahead and take that poll down and go to the next one. Okay, so have you ever landed a freelance job through On Demand? Oh, okay, a few of you. And I would ask that, and so far only two people have, not surprising at all, like I said, there's a ton of competition. If the two of you who have said yes, maybe there's more of you, if you wouldn't mind um, going into the chat box and just in a very, very briefly, share any tips that you, that you find that you, you think might be valuable about how you landed it. Uh, for example, I know that, um, that typically when you're, uh, to, to land one of these jobs, you have to get a good, um, uh, you have to get recommendations, like you have to have almost like the five star concept, you have to get rated, you know, by your clients. Uh, there's, again, it's an art and a science, not my expertise, but uh, we'd love to get the brain trust of the crowd. So if the two of you could just put a couple little notes in here for the benefit of others, that would be great. Okay, so two people have and most everybody else is not. <laughs> All right, Michael, if you could stop sharing. All right, and then, um, so now let's just, again, I'm, just, I'm gonna go through this fairly, fairly quickly in terms of an initial steps to your launch. And this is really just to get you off and running. So we mentioned the first thing about, you know, choosing whether you're gonna be a sole proprietor, LLC, or an S corp. Now this next thing, posting your URL. Bullets number two and three here get people a little bit wrapped around the axle. What in the world is all this web stuff? I'm gonna try to make it super, super clean and easy for you if I can. It kind of goes like this. Once you determine what your website name is going to be, all right, so johnsmithconsulting.com, right, probably already taken, but let's just say it's not. You've got to host that website name. In other words, you've got to host the URL. You've got to find somebody to do that. GoDaddy, Bluehost, there are other ones as well. Those are a couple of the big ones. Um, you can go and, and really for, I mean, cheap, 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 like 11 bucks or something, you know, you can host your URL. That's easy. In fact, a lot of people, and I've done this, I'm not sure, Michael, if you've ever done it, but I've grabbed a whole bunch of URLs. Uh, like, yep. for example, one of my concepts is, in my, the name of my company in my day job is called Purposeful Hire. My tagline is, for every hire, there is a higher purpose. And I came up with a concept that's called Hire Engagement, H-I-R-E, Hire Engagement. I have a whole principle around it. Well, I grabbed HireEngagement.com. Now, I've never done anything with it, but I have it in case I ever want to use it, right? Uh, nobody else can get it. So, you know, it's okay to rack up some URLs, but you do need I have, to get. I have the same thing, uh, Cher. Yeah. I, have, uh, I have eight different ones that I own. Mm -hmm. I really only use two. Exactly. Very, very right. common, okay, because you never know when you're going to use it. The next thing, though, is you need to, uh, two, two things, selecting a website builder and separately a website host. Two things, two different things. 
So a website builder is a newish, I don't know, last seven, eight years, I forget how long they've been around, but it really allows you to build your own website quick and easy. You don't need to hire a web designer anymore. I know the web designers see now they've been disrupted and they have to go repurpose to something else. But for, for you and me, rank and file people, we have all of these different platforms, GoDaddy, Wix, Weebly. There's other ones too. They keep proliferating. These are just a few of them where you can go in and you don't need any HTML skills. You don't need any web design skills. You just go in and you use their template and move it around. Um, it's simple. It's elegant. Now, it's not the most customizable thing. You get what you pay for, but it's pretty, pretty easy. Once you do that, you have to have your website hosted. Now, your website host and your URL host could be the same. So for me, that is the case. I got my, my web purposeful hire, excuse me, purposefulhire.com. I got that through, through GoDaddy. I built my website on GoDaddy and GoDaddy is hosted, hosting my site. By the way, not doing a commercial for them. I don't pay, they don't pay me to say this, but I think they're great. I love their customer service. That's just me, you know, make your own choice. Um, but you could, for example, uh, get your URL through GoDaddy, but you could do your website builder on Squarespace and then go have it hosted with someone else. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that because I get a lot of questions about that. You know, uh, sure. I built mine on uh, with GoDaddy as well, just as you, and I built the entire thing on my own. I think I watched three videos and, exactly. you know, crazy. over the years I've gotten a lot better at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And they keep adding, by the way, GoDaddy in particular keeps up, up top grading what they're doing because they of course have to be competitive. Uh, getting business cards, no big deal. Vistaprint.com, Moo.com, super, super easy. I would recommend putting your picture on your business card really helpful for people to remember you after you've finished a networking event because otherwise the card goes in the pile and never remember you. Put your picture on and get a really good professional picture. Um, create a branded LinkedIn profile. I could have a whole conversation with you guys on this. I actually do trainings on this, so I'm just going to make a quick mention. Everybody, every professional, W-2 or 1099 or S-Corp, every professional needs a professional and a compelling LinkedIn profile. Professionally speaking, if you are not on LinkedIn, you do not exist. And that is not an exaggeration. You just don't. You have to have a, a brand. But it's not just a summary of your experience. It's not just 25 years experience doing X, Y, Z. People just run through that. What they really want to know is your value. What is your value as a professional? Who do you serve? Why do you serve? How do you serve? In what ways do you serve? Now, we could have a conversation about what that looks like as a W-2 employee, but as a 1099 or says somebody self-employed, a different kind of profile because now you're selling yourself as a business not just as a professional so I, what i would encourage you to do is for some samples go to the um in fact actually michael or me you could go to us ours because we both have that kind of profile and uh, and and others in your in your in your network um who actually are real businesses self small businesses let's say where the person is the is the brand okay i don't just mean like nike or something i mean like a michael or a me where we in our brand, in our company, is exactly the same thing. We are solopreneurs. See how they've written their uh, their LinkedIn profile. A little bit of a different twist than just being a W two employee. Um, I mentioned that uh, you want to get your email. You want to, so I mentioned Office three sixty five. Try to find if you're comfortable with this. Um, getting a cloud solution is just great. I've had to get a few laptops in my time, and let me tell you, having everything in the cloud. Made it a snap. I mean, all my information came back right away and I didn't have to worry. Some people have uh, security issues with that and that whatever you, is your choice, that's just, that's been my choice. Uh, I suggest to hire an accountant even if you are one <laughs> because it's always good to have that outside advice, but um, that might be something you want to outsource. Consider some sort of legal support, maybe on the side, legal seems as an option, and then find a comfortable workspace. We've all had to do that recently anyway. Uh, you may want to go to a co-working space, uh, Starbucks when we reopen. I don't know how that's all going to work, social distancing, relaxing, but um, it's all, always good to find a place that you can feel really comfortable when you're working. Okay, great. And then helpful hints. So look, start with something. Get going. Do not get into this. I've got to have everything right before I launch. I will tell you there is analysis paralysis that will kick in just like that. And, and we have both, I've been there, Michael's been there, we've all been there. I gotta get the website, I gotta get the business card, I gotta get this, I gotta get that. And then all of a sudden, now you have no more excuses to start, it's like, <laughs> get a little fearful. Start somewhere. Use what some people call the lean business, uh, lean, lean startup model. Just try something, test it out. 
talk to friends, talk to colleagues, say, you know, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that. Do you, what, would you find this valuable? Who might find this valuable? And you do a little bit and you iterate. And don't be afraid of learning a little bit of new technology. I know it can seem scary for those of us who are of a certain age, but it's not as hard as you think. And sometimes you can get a person, sometimes a younger person to help you out, it's okay. <laughs> um, but, but you wanna just keep going and every day work on your launch. And even as you start getting business, it's very easy to, to, to put your business development aside. Highly discourage you from doing that because what happens? You've got a lot of business. You think, oh, I don't need to do any more marketing. And what happens? The economy changes or something changes and then whoosh, you go into the slump. You always want to be doing a little bit um, of your launch and a little bit of growth um, all the time. Uh, find people who can help you test your idea, engage, you know, get family, friends, colleagues, and really, really, very importantly, find people who can support you along the journey. You need a tribe of people who are going to say, yes, you can, and I believe in you. You don't want, you want to get rid of the stinker, stinking thinking people out of your life. You want the people who are going to be your cheerleaders and get you out of boys and out of girls. You know, uh, Shira, just let me add that, uh, you know, on the technology and the business thing, uh, one of the places to look for people to help you is your local community college. Uh, I've actually done that. You can go to the business department or the tech department and they have classes looking for projects that they don't charge any money for at all. And they give it back to you free 100%. So there's an option that some people uh, should yeah. try to look at. You uh, may be able to, to do like a, a create like a work study situation yeah, uh, with, 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 a, with a student, grad student, undergrad. Yep. Uh, and by the way, not for nothing, especially even with your website, there are a lot of right. um, younger professionals who, who, who are getting into uh, you know, user experience, UI, UX, and they just would love to do web, web development. So that's a way to, to do that. Okay, so now we're going to uh, do, a, do a breakout. And I'm looking at the time. And so we're going to try to keep this uh, fairly short. Uh, I think, I, I, even though I, I do want to leave some time for Q&A, I think it's going to be worth it for us to give everybody about 10 minutes for this. So what's going to happen is um, we're going to break you out into what's called Zoom rooms. And Michael is going to randomly, uh, he's going to hit a button. And when he does, uh, you and one other person are going to be paired up, okay? So you don't want to spend too, too long getting to know each other only because, um, you know, we only have so much time. We have about 10 minutes. But what I do want you to do, in fact, if those of you who can either take a screenshot of this um, or maybe jot down these questions really quickly, what I'd like you to do is just person A and a person B, share with each other a little bit of the work that we did today. You know, your high skill, high motivation, whether there's an, an er or more than one er that you found from that exercise, is there a target audience, an urgent problem, any of these questions, right? You, know, you, you, won't, you won't have time to answer all of them and you may want to exchange contact information to talk offline. And by the way, we when we're works, we're really about community building. So this is one way that we do that, is helping, pe helping people to connect. Uh, so when, uh, so what'll happen is Michael will put you in the room, then there will be a, a countdown, uh, I think it's 60 seconds out, from the time right. that when he was going to bring you back. So it'll be a slight delay when you guys get into the meeting. At the end, there will be a countdown. You don't have to exit the meeting yet. You can wait until the countdown is totally done because automatically you're going to come back into the room and we'll continue from there. Okay, Michael? So Here we go, folks. It takes a few it. seconds and you'll be off to meet a new friend. And then you want to unmute yourself. Make sure to unmute yourself. Yeah, unmute right. Yourself. There you go. Okay, they're off.
everybody will be back in. Some of you have uh, returned earlier, which is fine. Got about 30 more seconds. And now we're down to the 10 second countdown. How's business? Thank you. Okay, I think we're back. If you want to share your email with them or phone or whatever contact information you have. Um, and so we don't have a whole lot of time left, uh, but did want to see if anyone, um, so actually for, for the chat boxes, um, Heidi and uh, Heidi and uh, Ann have been, uh, Heidi and Ann have been, have been curating some for us. And Michael, um, I think, I was actually put in put into a Zoom room accidentally, so I didn't oh, get a chance to see you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was busy visiting question. rooms trying to help people out there, so I didn't catch it. Well, I saw I, I saw a lot of questions about the issue of franchising versus self employment, you know, and uh, you know we're not here to give legal advice, uh, but franchising is something usually you purchase into. It's a it's a larger personal investment. Uh, yes, you would you know you would either be a partner or you might own an area or something like that uh, but we really are concentrating primarily on the whole concept of uh, self-employment i also saw a lot of questions about the difference between llc's and c corps and uh, so forth and so on uh, and uh, once again you know we want to avoid uh, legal advice as you as you said a little earlier uh, neither of us are attorneys and we don't play one on television or on zoom so uh, i would i would i would urge i would urge people to you know go to uh legal zoom or you know um uh you know type in a search for local attorneys that do this kind of work i'm sure you'll find somebody and yep. they're probably less expensive than you think so I, I noticed a couple here I'm going to try to try, try to address, and I wish we could address, we had time for everybody. So one of them says, if you have multiple income streams under different company names, do you need business cards, basically bis different business cards for each? I'm going to do a, a, a qualified yes, no on that, okay? Here's, here's my it depends feeling on it. If you are, um, if you actually have different kinds of Really, really different kinds of different streams. Like you have a meeting planning uh, business, and you have a bookkeeping business, and you have I don't dog walking or whatever. Yeah, you're going to need multiple cards because if you give that kind of card to one person and they look at what you do, they're like, Wait, "What? I don't get it. None of this hangs together." Um, and so, like you said, under under different company names, I would absolutely say yes. You definitely need multiple. But I I want to put that little caveat. If you don't have different company names, meaning let's say you're you're, you're freelancing and you are, um, you have um, actually not even freelancing, but let's say you have a small business like or like me and Michael. Let's, let's still take us. We have a, a general rubric, right? So I do all things workforce, or not all things, but some things workforce, and Michael does a lot of association strategy. We have multiple practice areas, so we don't need different business cards. Right, we have one business card, and that everything sort of ties together. But yes, if you have different company names, completely and totally, utterly different businesses, um, I would I would have different cards. The other question, which I can't see anymore, but I, I think it said how did how long did our was our ramp up time? Uh, and uh, yeah, can we speak to the, our ramp up time to meeting our financial objectives? So I'll just speak for myself, um, and Michael, you can speak for yourself. Broadly speaking, if you ever research this topic, most people will say that it takes two years. You know, that sounds like a long time, but they say it takes two years to really hit your stride in terms of meeting 
the kind of financial objectives that you're looking for. That does not mean you're not going to make money in the meantime. Of course not. You can make money fairly quickly depending upon um, how, um, how much of a, of a market demand there is for what you're selling, um, how, 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 how readily available you have the skills that you're selling. There, you could potentially get, get a fairly decent amount of income more quickly. But part of that has to do with your, your reputation that you're coming from. So for me, and I think for Michael too, I came from uh, years of doing one thing. I was a recruiter and people knew me in that world. So when I flipped and I said, I am now add, I said to my existing community, I am now adding on career coaching. People were like, okay, what were they thinking? They didn't say it out loud, but what they were thinking is, okay, I trusted you to do the recruiting. I now believe when you say that you're going to do career coaching, I get it. And so business started coming in. Now, was I as busy, you know, in week three or month three as I was in year three? Of course not. At, over time, more and more people heard what I was doing. And then all of a sudden the referrals come trickling in and clients start referring me and all of that stuff. But that took a little bit of time. Um, I, I would say actually, when I hit the two year mark approximately, I was like, oh, wow. Now I, I started raising my rates. I had a lot of business, um, but I was actually able to still earn something in the beginning. And Michael, I'm not, I think you have a similar-ish kind of spring. Yeah, uh, I think uh, two years is a good line. I certainly recovered my costs within about a year. I didn't really start making money till about 18 months out and it's been upward ever since. So, uh, uh, I think, you know, the 18 months to two years is a, is a good ballpark for most people. To take and I, know, I don't want to scare people on this call who are looking for short term income streams. So uh, please well, understand that some. the kind of, yeah, everybody's, everybody's different. So please understand that Michael's uh, kind of business is, is he, he, his is a, a fairly high ticket item. I can say it that way. Okay. Yeah, that's, right. that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. So people, he had to build a reputation to offer what he offers. There are a lot of you out there that offer much lower cost services, um, much more high in demand, for example, freelance writing or web or project management, that kind of thing, where you could probably get up and running pretty quickly. Now you're not going to necessarily make as much as you're going to make in two years but you could yeah. absolutely start getting some short-term income. It's not, hopefully not gonna be an 18, yeah. 18 month ride so, for you. So Cher, we only have a couple minutes before our seven o'clock time reaches yep. us. I was wondering if uh, we can quickly run through these, uh, these extra yes. resources. Yeah, so ongoing here. coaching and support. Yep, and I'm, and I'm sorry that we're probably gonna go a little bit over seven. Hopefully you guys can stick with us. We're, we're trying to make it. Uh, so actually, if you could go back a slide, Michael. Oop, yep, sir. Thanks, right there. So here are a few. Um, you can keep the, you can put all of them up there. Uh, SCORE uh, is a nonprofit. Yep, stay right there. Thanks. Um, okay. SCORE is a nonprofit <laughs> where you can actually get free coaching. Uh, it, they don't have this. Yeah. Anyway, you can get free coaching from them, but SCORE.org has a ton of rich uh, web uh, videos, uh, articles, a lot of things to help you with your business. I mentioned your, your local small business development center. We put the link there so you can specifically find uh, really quickly, you, the one that's local to you, freelancersunion.org. They are only for freelancers, and one of their main um, their main offerings is they offer benefits, and they actually do advocacy work on behalf of freelancers, and they have certain uh, local groups uh, in different areas. Tap into other self-employment professionals in your network, find colleagues, people who, even if they don't do what you do, they're still in the same kind of boat, and they can uh, encourage you and cheerlead you and give you advice and ideas. Uh, if you're looking for actual business coaches, we at BoomerWorks can provide you names. Uh, we, we can't uh, certainly verify the, the quality you're going to get, but we can. We have a number of people in our network uh, who can do uh, small business coaching. I happen to do it. Michael does it. We have uh, Paulette um, is on our call here. Uh, Paulette, if you want to do a little shout out about your business, she does. She's one of our volunteers, and uh, and she also she specifically helps small businesses with their marketing. Uh, and these last two I put in blue, those are TPD, they're coming soon. This, what you're experiencing here is what we call a, a, a discovery meeting. This is just for those of you who are looking to explore the wide, wide world of self-employment. When you're ready, and some of you already are ready to jump in to the pool and start swimming, we intend to have what we call growth groups coming up proliferating here in the DC area. Now, depending upon how things reopen or whatever, our, our goal is to have a uh, face-to-face. -face. However, we see how successful this is. Very likely we will have virtual meetings because I know there are a lot of people outside the area. Uh, we'll see how we want to configure them, but there'll, ho there'll hopefully be small groups, maybe 10 or so people facilitated by one of our Boomer Works 
uh, coach facilitators uh, who can keep the group sort of flowing. And you guys will hopefully be sharing resources and encouragement and ideas and, and, and client leads and, and all of that. So we're trying to create a small community groups. And then we are intending also to provide a coaching program um, at, the, um, at some point, which will be more of a subscription model to give you guys some access to, to coaches uh, on a sort of a, a bit of a discounted basis, but, but stay tuned for that. Michael, last slide here. And these are the books that I was mentioning earlier that we find are interesting. The one on the left, if you know, know, know that you want to be a consultant, David A. Fields, fabulous, fabulous book. It is, he is all about business development and he has a highly relational approach to, to business development. Really, really recommend it. I have gobbled it up. I know, Michael, you've read it. A lot of people are, it's just I, got some great I used stuff. it, made an outline, followed it, and it that's when I really yeah. started to take off. And there you go. And, and uh, he has a free newsletter and he's cute and quippy and he's wonderful. So I highly recommend David A. Fields. And then if you go to this link, self-employment videos, if you just go to boomerworks.org, look at our resources tab, we have a video tab, which has a lot, a lot of videos that we curated from SCORE and from SBA. Uh, it's not the prettiest page, we're, we're working on that, but at least we have some, some good information there. Uh, so we would have, uh, you know, kind of taken this time to, to do a little bit more chatting about what your next step would be on your self-employment journey, but we want to be mindful of the, of the time. I uh, do encourage you guys to connect with each other. Now, um, as far as the um, getting back in touch with us, if you have any questions, if you, um, about anything we weren't able to answer, any questions about BoomerWorks in general, whatever you need, info at boomerworks.org. If you would like to donate, which we would be so grateful if you did, we are a 100% volunteer organization, but we do have some costs, as you can imagine. And, uh, and we are part of an organization called United Charitable, and there's some fees attached to that too. So uh, we really do uh, count on the, the volunteers and, and we count on uh, people like you who have found value from our work to make a donation of any size is, is okay, from the smallest to the largest, we'll take it all, it's all good. And because United Charitable is a 501c3 organization, it is tax deductible. If you'd like to volunteer, uh, we would love to uh, love to talk with you. In, uh, we have all kinds of volunteering opportunities from marketing and curriculum development. And in particular, we are looking for a program manager. Anne Happ has been a fantastic program manager for us. She needs to move on to other things. We love her, yay, thank you, Anne. And we are looking for someone as wonderful as her to help us sort of manage our program. We can certainly share more about that if you'd like to raise your hand, if you've got project coordination skills and that kind of thing. And if you'd like to be part of our community, please go to boomerworks.org. We have a join our community tab. Uh, you can just fill out a little form. We promise we're not gonna spam you. We just wanna keep you updated as to what we're doing. Uh, you could also, um, you know, a lot of you have already been on our meetup site. Uh, so it is two different things, or at least we, we try to aggregate them, but we really are trying to get everybody into the boomerworks.org site as much as possible, just for simplicity. And uh, we will be putting up this, the video, uh, the recording of this video, plus the PowerPoint slides, hopefully within the next week or so on our site. If you don't see it, feel free to email us and we'll, we'll let you know um, when that's coming. I hope I caught everything. And Heidi, Michael, am I missing anything? Hey, it's been great fun. Hopes everybody got a little bit out of this and uh, please visit the site and uh, good wishes, good health, good safety, and uh, everyone have a fine, fine evening. Yes. Wish blessings to everybody. Have a great night. So long. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.